Dr. Bujicevsky. Uh, it's good to have you here with us at Canwired. Uh, look forward to our talk, our visit. Welcome to Moscow. Thank you. Um, I would like to spend our time talking about natural law, which is a specialty of yours, something you focus on. And I'd like to begin by asking if you make a distinction between uh, natural law and natural revelation. And if you do make a distinction, what would it be? Or do you think that those are synonyms? Well, they're almost synonyms. I would say that natural law is a part of general revelation. Okay, Sub right. a subset of general. A subset of general revelation. General revelation is what God has, uh, what God has revealed to the whole human race, rather than just that uh, that that uh, special revelation which He has given to the community of faith. Okay. So, in general revelation includes the, the the possibility of knowing that there is a God from the okay. from the evidence of creation. Now, that's not specifically moral. Right. Although it has moral implications, but the uh, but general revelation al also includes uh, the fact that we can know his basic moral requirements, okay. even apart from the Bible, even apart from special revelation, and that's the natural law. Okay, so natural law is um, a subset of general revelation, mm -hmm. but not the entirety of it. Right. Right. Okay. So um, could an atheist? follow natural law while excluding some parts of general revelation? Well, he could in part. He could in part. An atheist, as a matter of fact, I get this from my students all the time. I'll talk about natural law. And uh, the mainstream of the natural law tradition has always held that um, that uh, its, uh, its authority and its knowability is rooted in God. Um, an atheist will say, well, I don't believe in God, and I, and I think that I can follow the moral law. I have a conscience. And I say, sure, you have a conscience. You can't help but have a conscience. This is built right. into us. There's a law written on the heart. Um, but the difficulty for you is going to be that since you don't believe in God, you're going to find it hard to explain to yourself what your conscience is. Okay. Uh, it, so you, it, can, you cannot account for your conscience you can't account from your premises. From your premises, you can't, you can't account for your conscience. You're going to have to turn it into, you're going to have to view it as an instinct that doesn't work or as uh, just some sort of leftover from how you were socialized. Well, there's much more to it than that. Uh, you're, you're, you, you, you aren't going to be able to explain how it, uh, how it speaks to you with authority, how it speaks in a, in a voice of law. Okay. And it isn't just a bunch of feelings or inhibitions and compulsions or something. Or like instinct. Or, or just instinct, raw instinct. Or just raw instinct. Yeah, and there's also, there's also the fact that even if he, um, even if he uh, is, uh, is uh, responding to deep conscience, he's not responding to all of it. Okay. Right? If he's rejecting God, then there's one part of his moral duty that he's certainly going to be neglecting. He's not going to be uh, one of the, if justice can be defined as, as, uh, as giving what is due to someone, rendering right. what is due to someone. Well, we render, we, we, adoration and gratitude are due to God. Okay, he's, now. And, and, and the atheist, he doesn't believe in God, he can't, he, can't, he can't render that to him. And he can't account, so he can't account for what he knows. He can't account for what he knows. How right. on earth do I know this? How on earth could there even be a right and wrong? Okay. And how on earth could I, could I know it? Now, in, um, if, if you were talking to someone from the uh, Reformed tradition or the Vantillian tradition, let's say, Van Til mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. or Frame or Bonson, uh, someone like that, they would, they would say, um, well, of course, Romans 1 tells us that uh, the heavens, that, that, that uh, God's character, His majesty, His attributes are seen in what is made. Yes. And in uh, in the Psalms, where uh, day unto day the, uh, the sky, the created order, pours forth speech. So they would say, yes, yeah, the Bible says that there is that God reveals Himself in um, in the created order. Yes. Right. Would you say yes? That's what I'm talking about. That's the same thing I'm talking about. Or is there something else going on? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly including that. Okay. Uh, I think that we can, you know, when Paul, when the Apostle Paul goes into the city of Athens, right. he comments to the men of Athens that he sees that they're very religious. They even, not only do they, do they, do they, do they recognize uh, such a thing as deity, but they also know that they're not really fully in touch with it. Right. They've got the altar to an unknown God. Right. They've got these Godward longings. Right. That are directing them to to the uh, to to a God whom they also know is unknown, right. and he, and and he says, I can tell you who he is. Right. Uh, 
Paul, interestingly, in the first chapter of the book of Romans, uh, doesn't criticize the pagans because they don't know about God. He doesn't say, those darn pagans, they ought to know about God and they don't. His right. criticism is rather they do know about God. It has been known since the beginning from what has been made, but they right. suppress it, right? right? They hold the knowledge down. They don't wipe out the knowledge. They can't destroy it, but they, they're in denial. Okay. They pretend to themselves that they don't know what they really do. Now, that's part of it. Okay. But moral revelation goes beyond that. I don't just know that there is a God, right? I, I, uh, I, there is, there's, for instance, there's, there's the, one of the witnesses that God has placed within us. There is conscience. Mm -hmm. there, is the, um, there, is, there are the details of our design. Okay. These, these give us clues as to how we need to live. For instance, the complementarity of the sexes, men and women. There's something missing in the makeup of a, of a man. Every wife knows this, <laughs> all right? <laughs> there are things that he needs to know. He needs to learn from her. He needs to be balanced by her. And, and women need to be balanced by men, too. We need each other. I, uh, I like to say at, at weddings, when I'm doing a wedding, that God created this and said it was good, and God created this and it was good, and he created this and it was good, and then he created a solitary male and said, that's not good. <laughs> it's, it's not good that man should be alone. Even yeah, even even a uh, even those who are called to uh, to a life of consecrated celibacy, uh, are, do not do not ignore the existence of the of the of the other sex. Uh, uh, the there is a there's a recognition of the complementarity of the sexes and the proper and the proper understanding even of that. Now I think that that um, and and then there's the witness of natural consequences when we when we live in a way that is contrary to uh, to the uh, to the natural law. Uh, our design, the the created order, uh, strikes back at us. Things happen. You know, you 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 abuse uh, heroin, and you're going to become enslaved. You you betray all of your friends. You're not going to have friends. You desert all your your wife and your children, and you're going to have no one giving you care and comfort when you're old and in need of care and comfort. You jump from bed to bed, and you're going to lose the very capacity for uh, for romantic trust and intimacy. Right. Do you uh, um, so so these are these are additional uh, witnesses, moral witnesses that God has placed in our nature. Uh, what you just talked on uh, when speaking of the complementary uh, complement, complementary nature of the of the sexes, and uh, sort of Paul says in Romans one, receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. If, yeah. if you abuse the created um, uh, aspect of your body, if you abuse it, through promiscuity or yes. or um, homosexuality or whatever, you're mm -hmm. you, you're not following the instructions and the whole thing's going to fall apart. It is That's a apart. central part of your argument. And it's a central part of my argument here, although I, although I try to accentuate the positive here. Right. I do talk about the natural consequences of defying all of this in the book, but I'm more focused on the possibilities of, of, uh, of, uh, of living in harmony with it. Okay, and the book for the viewers is on the meaning of sex. Um, and that's in the intercollegiate Studies Institute? Intercollegiate Studies Institute, ISI Books. ISI, ISI Books. ISI books. Um, so uh, going back to the natural revelation, when we, if we said um, that we look at the stars, we look at the ocean, we look at the planet, we look at our, the intricate structure of our own bodies. Um, my brother-in-law is a medical doctor and he had an atheist, unbelieving professor in medical school who said the liver is so complicated that God couldn't even make one. <laughs> You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 a very interesting that, argument against a, that, against that, that, against God. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is so complex. Our the the uh, delicacy and complexity of our of our being, the very nature of our being, all cries out for the existence of of God and His moral law imprinted on us. But as uh, how would you respond to the argument? Yes, that's all true. Um, that. The, nat the created order does this, but because we have fallen into sin, we are blinded to it. So that Paul says, yes, natural revelation leaves them without excuse, but it's not salvific. It's not something that... Oh, I certainly agree that it, in, in the first place that it's not salvific. Right. Now, I, I think, though, that I, I want to make a distinction, a very strong distinction, between uh, self-deception and, and ignorance. Okay. I think even when we are in denial, deep down we still know more than we admit to ourselves. When I was an atheist and when I, and a nihilist and denied that there was a real difference between, between good and evil, right. I really think that deep down I did, I did know 
I, and it was only in retrospect that I came to realize this. I was, I was very angry with God, and right. I, uh, and for not existing. For not well, <laughs> n no, but uh, not exactly. I, some people are angry, <laughs> are angry with him perhaps for not existing. But I, I told myself that he didn't exist partly as a way to get back at him. Okay. I had not been living in, in according to his plan. Predictably, all sorts of things went wrong in my life. Right. And uh, and uh, and telling myself that he didn't exist was a, was a sort of a way of getting divine revenge. You know, I I, uh, I I think that strange things like this were were going on in my life. So when I was saying that there was no God or there was no God who could make a difference, did I? Was it really the case that I was in complete ignorance all the way down? Right. No, I don't I don't think that I was. Yeah. Or when I told myself that there was good, no good and evil. Uh, I couldn't make sense of my love for my wife and my children, so but I did love my wife and my children so and, you're, and cared for them. You're, you're making a distinction then between pure ignorance or simple ignorance and culpable ignorance. Yes, I think that when you're when you're when you're t lying to yourself and telling yourself that you don't know what you really do, that I that is culpable. I wouldn't call it ignorance. I'd call it uh, pretended ignorance, and I think it's I think it's culpable. Okay. If it was if it was real ignorance, true I don't ignorance. think that we could be blamed. If it was true right. ignorance and we didn't have a clue, we didn't know. Right. I don't think even God could blame us. But uh, but um, but it isn't ignorance. It's uh, it is it is self deception. So um, the, Paul in Romans says it's through the law that we have knowledge of sin. So it's in order to have sin, in, in order to have that yeah, culpability, ahead. there's got to be some awareness. Of there's got to be some. There's got to be some awareness. Yes, I think that's right. And you might kick against the goad. You know, you might, you might, uh, you might be infuriated by that, by by your awareness of the law, <laughs> instead of uh, instead of responding to it. But but uh, but you really know deep down that's wrong too. Okay. Well, let's let's talk for a moment about how to how we can cash this out. Um, if there is a natural law, just as if there's such a thing as canon law, you have canon lawyers. If you're Idaho law, you have Idaho, you know, lawyers sure. admitted mm -hmm. to the Idaho mm -hmm. bar. Uh, are there natural lawyers? Yeah, I use the expression natural lawyers all the time. As a matter okay. of fact, it's just a, as a sort of a punning uh, way of speaking of natural right. law thinkers, natural law philosophers. How do, how do you get admitted to the bar? How do you get admitted yeah. to the bar? Well, you know, all of us have a, have a sort of a natural qualification because we've okay. all... An expression that I like to use is the uh, the, the the four witnesses. Okay. We, we all have the four witnesses. Saint Paul uh, speaks to the pagans in a certain city. The incident is recorded in the Book of Acts. He sa he says to, no these 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 guys are pagans. They're not Jews. They, they didn't know about uh, about Torah. They didn't know about the revelation through Moses. They didn't know about any of this stuff. Um, but he says God uh, God did not leave uh, the nations without witness. Right. He, all those Gentile nations, he didn't leave them without witness. Now, some people have taken that to mean uh, personal witness, yeah. and he could have meant that in part. There were uh, Jewish missionaries, uh, a lot of people don't realize this, who went out to the pagan lands and sought converts. There are allusions to this in the gospel. But I think that this, this, if you look at the context, he says witnesses like God sent you rain in fruitful seasons. He means witnesses that are built into, uh, into the structure of creation itself and built into the the plan, you might say, of God's providence, of how he governs the universe. Uh, so what would those witnesses be? Well, there's, you know, there's, there's deep conscience, the law written on the heart, there is, there is, and that isn't just a residue of what's pumped in by socialization. Right. There is, uh, uh, there is, uh, there is the recognition of the designedness of things, okay. which does a lot for us. For one thing, it, 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 it fortifies that first witness, conscience. Okay. Because if you didn't know that conscience was designed, you'd have no reason to to take it seriously. You would just say, "Man is man is the result of a meaningless and purposeless process that did not have us in mind." And conscience is one of those meaningless parts. Uh, there's the there's the recognition of the details of the design. I mentioned mentioned one we were talking about is sexual complementarity, uh, and then there's the witness of natural consequences. Those four clues we all have. Okay. The classical natural law theories weave together. All of those four witnesses. Um, okay. There are some getting off the track natural law theories that try to pay attention to just one or two of those witnesses at the expense of the others. Um, let's talk for a minute about the consequences. You mentioned heroin addiction. You you sure. you mm -hmm. wreck your body, and promiscuity. You wreck your body. You, you just you do a lot of damage. Yeah, d we do damage also to ourselves, not just physically but socially. You know, kids raising up with kids growing up without dads. Okay, we do damage to ourselves. 
noetically. You know, one of the consequences, if, if, if deep down you know that something is wrong and you tell yourself it isn't, and you do it, okay. and you're trying to pretend to yourself that you didn't know that you did wrong, you will suffer consequences, uh, uh, certain pathologies as a result of your guilty knowledge. I'd, I'd count that too. Okay. Now, suppose you, you're talking to an unbeliever who's, who comes to the exchange prepared to swallow the reductio, let's, let's say, uh, David Hume. And he says, yes, but how do you know damage is bad? How, how do you, the famous problem, how do you get from the is, I admit, he'll, mm -hmm. he'll say, I admit that this junkie has wrecked his body. Yeah. I, I admit that these consequences, but we're just describing consequences in the world. How do we know? Yeah. How do we get from is, yeah. is to ought? Yeah, I think that the so-called naturalist fallacy is, uh, is not a fallacy. There are a couple of natural law thinkers who think it is a fallacy and who try to develop versions of natural law theory that get around that. I don't think they really work. Um, the, the, and interestingly, uh, philosophers have been, been recognizing more and more since at least the 1950s, the work of, uh, of a Christian philosopher named Peter Geech, that, the so that there are certain legitimate ways of getting from is to ought. One of his examples is, this isn't moral law, but the question is whether you can get from descriptive premises to evaluative conclusions. Okay. I may, I may, I may make the, uh, the descriptive observation that the, that the purpose of a soccer ball is to play soccer, ball, soccer with. Okay. Well, if that's true, then if a soccer ball is unsuitable for the game, you know, it's leaky, let's say, right. it can't hold air, yeah. uh, then it's a bad soccer ball. Okay. All right. I, well, now, bad, hmm, that's an evaluative conclusion. Mm -hmm. When you know the function of something, which is right. evaluative, which is uh, descriptive data, you can reach an evaluative conclusion. Now, we can do things like that. We can say, well, the function of the eye is to, uh, is to see. So a bad eye is so a blind a, uh, Yeah, uh, if, if the eye can't see well, it's a bad eye. And since good is to be done and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and brought about, uh, the right thing to do with a bad eye is try to help it to be a better one. Okay. Okay. Then you can, and a lot can be learned this way. What is the, uh, what is the, uh, what is the, what is the, uh, what is the purpose of the heart? Well, it's to pump blood. What is the purpose of the lungs? To oxygenate the blood. I shouldn't be sniffing glue. Right. All right. What is the, uh, what are the, what are the purposes of the sexual powers? Well, they have to do with, the f with, with making families, with procreation, and with the unity of the, of the spouses, the two procreative partners. Right. What are the what is the purpose of anger? It's, it's to arouse us to the defense of endangered goods. And when it's used, when it's used in a way that's, that's uh, detrimental to that, that's a bad use of anger. Okay. You know, uh, you can, these, these are all ways of getting from is to ought that are legitimate. What do you, um, have you, uh, don't want to ask you Cole because you may not have um, uh, done much with him, but what do you think of Thomas Reed's contemporary answer to David Hume? You know, where he, common sense, Scottish common sense, philosophy. Well, uh, yeah, I think Scottish, Scottish common, common sense philosophy um, uh, and a lot of other Enlightenment philosophies, as a matter of fact, kept, had retained some pieces of the classical natural law tradition, but not all of the pieces. Okay. And there's a lot of problems there because, because um, the classical natural law wants to say, no, this, is, this isn't just a moral sense. Uh, analogous to the sense of touch, or the sense of smell, right. or the sense of hearing, which some of the common sense, you know, some of the common sense philosophers said, it's uh, this is actually moral knowledge. What we're talking about is the mind. These are we're using the faculties of knowledge. the The expression that I've used, deep conscience, is a sort of a paraphrase of a term that was used, syndesis, which means the, which means the uh, the the natural uh, habit of the mind, so that it 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 the tendency of the mind. To be aware of the uh, of the very of the foundational principles of moral reasoning. So, natural law. Let's say someone in the grip of natural law, he has do, he does something contrary to it. You're saying more than that. This results in vague guilty feelings. You're saying this results in a knowledge of guilt. Oh, as yes, as a matter of fact, it may not result in guilty feelings. Right. Uh, I think. Probably every one of us has had the experience at some time in his life of doing something you knew was wrong, but you didn't feel bad. Didn't, right. So that right there tells us that there's a difference between guilty knowledge right. and guilty feelings. Guilty. Right. If you if we use the word remorse for guilty feelings, you can have guilt, you can have and you can have the knowledge of your guilt and not have remorse. 
Right. There are, in fact, some people who never experience remorse, but that's different than saying that they don't have guilty knowledge. Right. People who study so-called sociopaths right. um, are often puzzled because they, they, many of the psychologists are confused. They think that, that mm. since these guys never experience remorse, they think they don't have a conscience. But that can't explain the fact that Curiously, sociopaths make excuses for their wrongdoing. <laughs> and they make use of moral principles in order to try to make excuses for themselves. Why is that going on? There was a fellow in, um, in Austin who, um, he was interviewed by a, a reporter. This was in the newspaper years and years ago. Uh, he, had, uh, he, had, he had shot and killed a uh, video store rental clerk. Um, but he uh, he told the police, he told, he told the first reporter who spoke to him that he didn't feel any remorse for this. He didn't feel bad. A second reporter went out and talked to him. <laughs> I don't know why. And said, you really don't feel bad for what you did? The police were saying he has no conscience. The first reporter said he has no conscience. And the, the fellow said, uh, said, uh, said, you really don't feel bad for what you did? He said, uh, he said no. Now, I don't know this for a fact, but per I, I suspect that the reporter just was dumbfounded and didn't know what to say next, and that perhaps what the prisoner said next was speaking into that silence. Right. Silence is helpful sometimes. The guy said, yeah, I, I don't feel bad for what I did. Pause, pause. There must be something wrong with me, don't you think? Because I should feel bad for what I did. Right. Now, if you feel bad right. for not feeling bad, do you feel bad? Then you've got guilty knowledge. Right. You may not have normal guilty feelings, but yes, you've got guilty knowledge. This man had a conscience. Okay. Um, one of the, pr one of the uh, as we're playing sort of philosophical, theological bumper cars in the, in the um, uh, natural revelation, uh, let's, let's return to the Vantillian, we need special revelation because natural revelation, however true it is, we're blinded by sin. Uh, we resist it. We fi we fight it off as, as we, as you described earlier, but not successfully. In other words, we we have enough revelation from God or revealed to us from God to kn to know that we're guilty, to have this guilty knowledge, mm -hmm. but it's not salvific. Yes. Now, so then someone comes and preaches the gospel. We have special special revelation. And of course, the same thing is true of special revelation. People can be as blind to the Bible as, sure they can. Mm -hmm. as, as they are to the created order. Mm -hmm. And you can't see what God's saying in the Bible any more than you can see what he says in the stars without grace, without, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. without God giving you that gift. Yeah, so, yeah. A, but full disclosure here, I'm not a Vantillian, but right. those things that, the, that, that, that Vantill is saying, there are things that every Christian would say. I think okay, I so think you agree I think with those, that? I think I agree with that, sure. Okay, so let, I'm, I'm trying to get to a place where... Na natural, nat natural law, the knowledge of natural law alone is not salvific. You can try, yeah. you can try and try and try and do the right thing. Okay. But let's fa let's face it. As C.S. Lewis said, there are two clues to the meaning of the universe. Right. There's the one that, that that there is there really is a law that we didn't make. Right. But the other big clue to the meaning of the universe is we don't live up to it. Right. We there's something wrong with us. Okay. And we can't fix it. Right. Somebody is going to have to help us. You know, Paul speaks to the to the Athenians about the unknown God. I think much of the human race is 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 longing for the unknown savior. Right. And so that's why the gospel can come as good news that just as the unknown god really exists, you know, Paul can right. say I can tell you who he is, the unknown savior does. It's also interesting uh, in Athens that that altar to an unknown god was a monument to the plague that Athens had had centuries before and they called for um, Epimenides the Cretan mm -hmm. that Paul in Titus calls a prophet, one of their own, mm -hmm. and he came to Athens, and he, he's the one who told them to sacrifice to the unknown god. Yeah. Um, I, I think that there are, I think that one of the reasons why people can respond who have not, cult, cult, whole cultures sometimes who have not heard the gospel, can respond to the, to the, uh, to the gospel is that this longing for the unknown savior okay. has been planted in them by God. All right, now, it, it seems to me that you, if we went to a, an island, uh, some island somewhere where you had, an, uh, where missionaries had not gone and, and people had an, uh, an awareness of the Most High God and they, but they didn't live up to it, they were sinful, you know, the whole thing. We could have a, an interesting philosophical, uh, you know, uh, debate, discussion, panel discussion between presuppositionalists and evidentialists and Vantillians and non-Vantillians and everything. Mm -hmm. But the real uh, sticking point, it seems to me, comes when you're dealing with natural law in sort of uh, 
nations that used to be part of Christendom. So you you have a, a or or nations like ours where there's a a, a prevalence a, a, a widespread knowledge of of the faith from special revelation the, yeah. the, the knowledge of the post Christians post Christians or you've got so you've got a lot of people who've read the Bible and a lot of churches and and so you've got and a public policy issue comes up mm -hmm. now the the question that I have here is and and I I'm not sure how how this can be navigated quite, but uh, in uh, harken back to a couple of essays you wrote a number of years ago. I thought they were magnificent Thank essays. Um, the problem with liberalism and the problem with okay, yeah, I know the con ones. conservatism for first things. I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, now one of the, one of the charges that you lay, and you're talking about secular liberals, liberalism and secularized conservatism. You yes. know, sort uh -huh. of right wing, left wing, right um, sort of things, but all part of the liberal, secular, liberal establishment. Right. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, so one of the, uh, uh, and I thought both essays were fantastic and great. Well, the first charge you lay at the feet of secular conservatives, cons conservatism is the charge of civil religion. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, sort of a generic deity. Yeah, well, yeah, and religion for the sake of usefulness, for the sake of making people good citizens, for the sake of the state, right. rather than for the sake of God, for the, right. because it's true. Right. So you were, uh, that was a later, I think you called it instrumentalism, yes. where, uh -huh. where you're trying to right, get... Right, right, I did distinguish. <laughs> okay. So you remember my article better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I read it back then and just recently refreshed, so, um, but, but with this, um, so my question is, this natural law, excuse me, this uh, civil religion, mm -hmm. a generic deity, um, it, isn't that what natural law gets us? No, I don't think so. Okay, could you, um, could you tease I, that I out, think, um, um, if, when uh, I, I know what you mean by a generic deity. Sometimes people say, we ought to be for religion in general. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is a there. The people will say, uh, you know, religion is a good thing, and I always want to say, well, what religion are you talking about? Do you mean Shinto? Yeah. Do you mean Do you mean Christianity? Do you mean uh, Do you mean those Do you mean those things that let's say Christians and Jews and 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 deists agree about? Do you yeah. mean Do you mean uh, voodoo? Yeah. <laughs> do you mean Do you mean Do you mean uh, thuggy, the assassin right. yeah. cult of worship of the goddess Kali? Uh, religion in general is not a good thing. Right. You know, in in fact, even secularism, insofar as all secular creeds posit some object of ultimate loyalty, right. they've all got some god with a little g. You right. know, that's religion too, but it's it's not necessarily good. Now, the God of the the God that natural law is, is talking about, um, it, it, what 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 we say that you the, that you can know about God from general revelation, is not a general God. He could be any of those things, right? right? It's it's possible from the evidence of creation to know that there is a God, mm -hmm. that He is the Creator, that there's only one of Him. That he's bigger than the United States. That he's way bigger than the United States. <laughs> that the United <laughs> States better not think that he can take him under its wing. That that he is good. Okay. okay? That he is uh, that the that he is the origin. That he is the un, the, the creator and the uncreated origin he, of all our conceptions of goodness. Now that right there, it isn't generalized God anymore because it rules out a whole lot of conceptions of God. Okay. It rules out. Uh, Kali, the you know the the, the goddess of death. It, yeah. rule, it rules out voodoo deities where it's all about the accumulation of power. Right. You know, it rules out many things. Um, it's just that there are some pieces missing. Reason, you know, through the evidence of uh, through the evidence of how we are made and how the cosmos mm -hmm. is made, can take us up to a certain point. But it can't take us the rest of the way, and Revelation takes us the rest of the way. And now, what we've got now is not only the evidence of of, uh, of of nature, of creation, but the evidence of history of what this God, this God who created the universe, this God who is who is the author of the moral law, is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Moses, and who came among us as Jesus Christ, and who died for our for our sins. Okay, so would you say that natural law gets us to the Christian God? It gets us to the Christian God, but without knowing, uh, but but by itself, it can't it can't tell you. Uh, I, I mean, I could take that in a certain sense as yes, it gets you. It gets you to it gets you to identifying uh, some things about the Christian God, but you okay. don't have all the details filled in. All right, so you um, 
so you exclude by the by a, a correct application of what you're describing as the natural being a natural lawyer um, you you work through this and you exclude Melanesian frog worship and you exclude yes sure you know you exclude yeah, you can wipe you, you you say it isn't that it isn't that it isn't that, that. Um, it's 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 a creator he's good he's the author of the moral law he's the source of our being he's the source of all possibilities of, of joy and goodness but I don't know who he is now revelation but, comes along and says this is who he is okay now when I get to revelation does it do I have is it sort of like the final four <laughs> where I've got, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't have a sports gene. You're going to have to explain. <laughs> okay, it's either, it? that's either that or it's Marvel Comics. <laughs> but no, that's the Fantastic Four. <laughs> okay, right. So you've got. Do I now need special revelation to decide between Islam and Judaism and Christianity and let's say Jefferson Deism, Jeffersonian Deism, or do I need um, special revelation to decide between the Baptists, the Presbyterians, and the Catholics? Uh, how? Do I get to a, a okay. triune God by me? Oh, okay. Well, I don't think that I don't think by reason alone you can get to the triune God. Okay. 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 I think you need revelation for that. For that. Okay. Now, on the other hand, um, revelation is not. Uh, I don't. We don't. We don't have to be fideists here. We don't have to say I believe because I believe because I believe because I believe. I don't think that's how the, how Tur the Holy turtles Spirit. all the way down. Yeah, <laughs> it turtles all the way down. I don't think that's how the how the Holy Spirit works. And even in even under under the uh, under the influence of grace, okay. uh, we aren't shutting off our minds. It's that our our minds are being assisted here. All right. So and 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 one can give, for example, uh, uh, you know, classically, Christians would Christians would say, well, why do you believe this? Why do you believe that Jesus was? Well, we have, we've got some arguments here. We've had some evidence. Uh, he performed these miracles. He, okay. There was the empty tomb. There is the uh, there there is the continuing there is the continuing work of the Holy Spirit among us. There's the there's the astonishing fact of the survival of the church in all these in all these centuries. Uh, there is the uh, there's the work of the apostles. There's the chain of witnesses. Now you can say, well, those are arguments from authority. Don't do, those don't mean anything. Arguments from authority are very reasonable. I only know that I only know that there is a country called China because of authority. I've never been there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there are there are uh, there are many things I only know because 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 trustworthy witnesses have told me. So if you have, um, let's say you took out a dollar bill and it says on there, "In God We Trust," yeah. is that the God of natural law, oh. or is that? There's no telling what there's no telling what Congress meant. Probably when Congress uh, when Congress uh, uh, enacted this this as a model for the United States right. in God We Trust, I'm sure that some of the members of Congress had in mind uh, had in mind uh, uh, the 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 God of Abraham, Isaac, and Moses right. who came among us as Jesus Christ, and others who knows they might have they might have met some God of civil religion. There, there. Who knows what God they all they all had in mind? Okay. Uh, and 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 it's 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 very odd when you read what the Supreme Court has said about these things. Yeah. The, some the in in, uh, in one famous case, both the both the right wing of the court and the left wing of the court, uh, Justice uh, O'Connor was on, at that time considered in the right wing, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and Justice Brennan who was on the left wing, both said the reason that you can say things like in God we trust. Um, is because um, they're only uh, they're they you're because you're not actually endorsing belief in God. Yeah, because they we're said it's just because we're hypocrites. Yes, we're, because we're hypocrites, right? We're, it's just pious stuff that motivates people to sacrifices that they wouldn't otherwise undertake. Now and now that's very funny too because yeah. why would it motivate them if they didn't believe it? Yeah. So basically, what you're saying is we, <laughs> the godless elite. <laughs> <laughs> who, who enact this? We don't believe it, right? But we're pulling the religious strings of all those suckers down there who do believe it. It's like what the sociologist Peter Berger once uh, famously said when he, he said, "He said if the it's sometimes said that the Indians are the most religious people in the world, mm -hmm. and that the Swedes are the least religious." He says America is a country of uh, as a country of Indians ruled by Swedes. Yes. <laughs> now, if if that's the case, if you've got. Um, uh, this goes back actually to Cicero's instrumentalism, you know Cicero. You who, know, I, I'm I'm not so sure. I used to think Cicero was an instrumentalist, and I'm not nearly as sure of that now as, okay. I, as I, I I'm I'm coming to think now that in in the last five years or so, I've been coming around to the view that he really did believe it. Okay. I think he thought it was also instrumentally helpful, but but I think he really did believe really did that believe this it. God that he was talking about was 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 the real thing. Okay, so you would say he was a natural 
he came to a I god. Think a, I think he was a natural. I think he was a natural lawyer. I think he did believe that he did believe on grounds of natural revelation that there was deity. Okay. Now, in the in the late forty, back in the era of um, inserting under God in the Pledge of Allegiance and uh, the Eisenhower era, mm -hmm. um, in the late forties and early fifties, when a, a lot of this was going on, uh, the National Association of Evangelicals at that time were pressing a main part of their agenda. They were pressing for a constitutional amendment confessing the lordship of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. right? So when, when the evangelical, sort of the anti-communist conservative bloc that was driven by, you know, it was, there were many evangelicals involved in, in that sort of crusade and Billy Graham, among, Billy Graham among them, they were thinking in explicit Trinitarian terms mm -hmm. when, when they su supported in God we trust. Mm -hmm. when they, uh, all right, so they're confessing the God of revealed religion. Yes, they are. Uh, okay, now someone else, I, I guess my question would be, what should we do? If, if, I, if, if I'm uh, surfing the, the web and I come across your problem with liberalism and mm -hmm. problem with conservatism, it seems to me that your rejection of both those secular ideologies mm -hmm. is explicitly Christian. Yes. Okay. Now that means that if we're going to do something that isn't falling into the binary, you know, the dichotomy of liberalism or conservatism, that that requires us to not agitate for, but work for, pray for, labor toward um, a polity or a commonwealth based on revealed religion, or should we strive for uh, should we strive for a yeah. polity based on natural law, or should we be allowed to know more? Because God has told us more. Okay. Well, first of all, I think I think we need to strive for a polity that is, in the first place, founded on natural law. First uh, place. Yes. Uh, um, you know, Paul, in a famous passage, remarks about he's not talking about natural law. He's talking about the law of Moses. Right. He says that it was a, um, a pedagogos. Uh, that was a Greek word. It meant the 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 there was a certain servant who would escort the children to school and mm -hmm. make them mind their manners and teach them some elementary things. But he wasn't really their teacher. He would get them to school, and then the, right. the real teachers would take over. Uh, and uh, and he said the that the Torah, the law of Moses, had been uh, uh, like that servant. It had been a pedagogos, uh, a, a a child. A boy leader right. to the to the uh, to the Hebrew people, so mm -hmm. that they could come to the school of Christ. Okay. Now, I, I think that the way that Torah functioned then for the Hebrews who were who thereby led to Christ, um, I, I think that the natural law can work that way. Okay. It heightens your your awareness of the natural law. It it may help to foment in you a sense of holiness, a longing for it that you don't have, so that you are ready for it the gospel. You can be led. You can be led to the school of Christ. Uh, now, can a, can a nation, can a polity go further than that? Can yeah, there be such that, a thing as a Christian polity? That's, 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 a, that's pretty tough. I think that I don't have any problem. Suppose that you set, had a population of people and they were all Christians, right. and they wanted to acknowledge this publicly, and they and they 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 have they establish a day of Thanksgiving. Right. <laughs> you know, the president right. says, uh, "Let's set aside a day of Thanksgiving and fasting." Our American presidents used to right. do that, and they had, they they meant it in an entirely yeah. Christian sense. Uh, uh, let's give thanks. Uh, we have a we have a legislative chaplain and so forth. I don't have any problem with that. Uh, on the other hand, if you're if you're pressing for things like that. Gosh, we've got to get prayer back into the schools. Right. And what you have is a religiously divided country. Is this really promoting? Is this really promoting right. promoting faith in God? It's more likely that it's promoting hypocrisy. I think. Okay. So you're, you, what you're hesitant about there is a top-down imposition yeah. of revealed yeah. religion. Yeah. I don't. I don't think that the state. I don't think that the state uh, is the custodian of special revelation. Okay. I don't think that the state can do much. To to uh, to in in the way of explicit encouragement of faith in Jesus Christ, what the state can do is take care of its own work, which is which which um, uh, uh, just the promotion of, of 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 the common good of those things that even we and the non-believers can recognize belong to the common belong to the common good because of the natural law. So, but if it, if I'm understanding you rightly, if it if it bubbled up. From grass, the grassroots, if it came up organically and naturally, and you had 
uh, you know. An oh, idol. sure. Yeah, yeah. I, that and, can happen. The Constitution of Ireland used to used to include an explicit acknowledgement of uh, of Jesus Christ. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't I don't have any. If a people, uh, if it it's grassroots, it bubbles up from the top. It's not an attempt by the state to club you know club people into in, into into belief or put them in jail for not believing right. or something. Then uh, yeah, I, well why not? Why, why would we not all express publicly what we all believe? Right. Got it. So so basically, what you're saying, if I'm there's the there have been periods in Christian history where the the Lord's words compel them to come in have been taken in the through, wrong way the wrong way yes and and so uh, what you're saying is that religious liberty is a is a Christian doctrine it is a Christian it, doctrine as a matter of fact um, um, we often misunderstand this there's a sort of a mythology that says that Christianity has always been against religious uh, liberty and religious toleration. That's false. Mm -hmm. And that religious toleration was never invented until the Enlightenment. <laughs> and that's false. <laughs> In right. fact, there are new forms of religious oppression that began with the Enlightenment. Um, what you do see, though, is that there is a difference between two conceptions of religious toleration or religious liberty. The patristic writers, uh, 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 for instance, a number of them, uh, St. Hilary of Poitiers, for instance, says, God does not desire an unwilling worship right. or, a, or a coerced obedience because true faith in God has to come from the heart. It, it's only willing. It, you, it's just like you can't, you can't compel somebody to love a woman. Mm -hmm. He's, he, he, it, this, does, is a free, this is a free act of the will. Uh, you can't. This is this is why marriages without con the consent of both parties are not are not valid. Uh, faith is like that too. It can't. It by its own nature, it cannot be coerced. The fathers of the church, the patristic writers, were very very explicit about this. They were explicit about this back in the days when they were still under persecution from the pagans, and they said, "This is why you shouldn't be. Prom you imagine that you're promoting religion according to your ideas of religion, hmm. but." True religion cannot be promoted by faith. That which is, excuse me, by coercion. Whatever it is that can be promoted by coercion isn't faith. Mm -hmm. uh, and after the uh, after the, uh, the uh, Christianity rose to predominance culturally in the in the empire, they actually continued to say this. Right. Now, contrast that with what we understand religious toleration to be today. You see, there they said because we know the truth about God and because we know the truth about faith, that there is a God, but that he does not desire unwilling worship and faith is by its nature a thing that can't be coerced. We know these things to be true, therefore we must tolerate unbelief. Right, right. Now, today though, uh, liberal toleration says we must suspend judgment. We don't know what's true and that's why we must tolerate right. uh, any other sort of belief. Now, if you really didn't know, then how would you know that you should tolerate? Right. And even if you did believe that you should tolerate, how would you know what to tolerate? Because nobody imagines I can't, that everything should be tolerated. Let us tolerate rape. Let us tolerate, sure. let us tolerate theft. Let us tolerate murder. Uh, let us tolerate chewing gum in the movie theater. <laughs> right? Everybody makes distinctions. You have to know something. It, the, it, I, I think the liberal fear is if we, if we believe that we have the answer to what's good and evil, then we'll suppress everything that we think isn't good. Okay. But that's not true. The knowledge of the good can give you some of the reasons why there are even some evils that up to a point have to be tolerated. Okay. So if you have... Um uh, it, so the the current mission of zealous uh, tolerance, what I call the tolerance buzzsaw. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. neutralist tolerance, <laughs> suspension of judgment, which is really a form of intolerance. Uh -huh. Right, because you're you're simply uh, what it, it it's not it's not honest. It is. So, that's uh, absolutely uh, right. The, the philosopher John Rawls is a good example of that. What he right. means by public reason is essentially limits on the kind of reasoning that's allowed in public. <laughs> <laughs> right, so that was my, the, my line of questioning earlier, is that if we, if we believe, as, as Christians who believe in general revelation or natural revelation and special revelation, it's like uh, reading an author who's written two books. And if we confess, it's the same author of both books. It's the same author of both books, but one of the books is, one of the, books is the elementary book and the other one goes further. Right, and so you're not objecting to those who have the primer and they go as far as the primer goes. Right. Right. Th th that's what you're saying. That's what I'm but saying. But you're not, you're not setting the primer and the advanced textbooks at odds with each other. Like oh, that's, uh, yes, that's correct. There are, there are some who think that it was a sort of a pagan thing. For example, when the Declaration of Independence said, um, 
it appealed to the laws of nature and to nature's mm -hmm. God in order to justify the cause right. of uh, independence from England. No, I don't think that that was in itself a pagan thing. Jefferson, who wrote the, de <laughs> the Declaration, was a pagan, <laughs> but the statement itself is not in itself pagan. And most of the uh, most of the American founders uh, took it in a, in a, uh, in yeah, a perfectly yeah, faithful way. Right, and the Constitution was uh, some years ago. I there was a dust up here, and I I wrote to the paper and said. Uh, Someone claimed there was no reference to God in the Constitution. I said, well, yes, there was, and offered $10 to the first kid at Moscow High, sc high School who could find it, and and there was a commotion. Well, it turned out the whole thing was ratified in the year of our Lord. Um, <laughs> 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 big, big signature. Yes. They, were operating, they were operating in a different context they than, were. The, than the modern secularist context. Yeah, they were. They had some difficulties. One of the reasons, you know, you think, well, these guys believed in natural law. These guys believed in general revelation. What happened? One of the difficulties is that the theories of natural law that they believed in had already been thinned and flattened by the influences of the Enlightenment. Okay. They, were, they were inferior theories of natural law. And they'd, they'd already thrown a lot of the classical equipment of the natural law tradition out the window. And that was, I think, one of the reasons why it couldn't keep it couldn't con keep flying. This bird, this bird fell to earth, so that in uh, in subsequent generations, people even forgot the very name natu natural law. What does that mean? What is that? Okay. So, to sum up, um, y are you comfortable with? Um, y so you're comfortable with saying that God reveals Himself, His ways, and His His character, His attributes, in a primer that all human beings have access to. Yes. And that's what you're calling natural law, all uh, reflective. Sure, natural theolo theology and natural law, right. Uh, okay. And uh, as a confessing Christian, you believe that nothing that we uh, learn here it, by, by means of reflection and reason will be overturned Correct. later by faith. That's right. Okay, it's going to be consistent. It will be it har will harmonious. Be, it'll, it'll be, in fact, uh, helped by okay. faith. There are so many things, you know, and it's a funny thing. There are a lot of things that, in principle, you can know by by natural reason alone. Okay. And yet, which most natural law philosophers didn't quite figure out until they also had the help of revelation. Now that's curious. Mm -hmm. If you should have, if you should have been able to figure out things about the the one God without revelation, uh, why didn't you? I, I think of it this way, you know, I, I, I sometimes wander around the house maybe with my glasses up here and I say, honey, have you seen my glasses? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, in principle, I could discover where they are, right. but I may need it brought to my attention. Right. Now, one of the things, one of the many things that Revelation does, it tells us some things that go beyond what we could have known from the natural law, but it also calls our attention to some things that we should have known from the natural law but weren't paying attention to. One, one last question that I, I, I probably should have inserted earlier. When I, when I say, I am much more comfortable with the term natural revelation as opposed to natural law. Mm -hmm. um, but as, as we're discussing this, I, th I think that this, these things can be harmonized. But one yes, difference uh -huh. is that uh, in natural revelation, God is the one doing the revealing. Yes. Okay. In natural law, is God just putting stuff out there that we figure out? Or is it, is it would you say in natural law, a natural law approach done right, God is doing the revealing. Are you I would still say God is doing the revealing, um, but uh, God works through. But God works through secondary causes, right? I don't, I don't. I don't think. You know, there are some. Uh, I'm told that there are now some, for instance, chemistry textbooks in some of the Islamic republics that, where where it says God so so makes it happen that when this molecule is <laughs> is with this, um, but God works through second. He's he's created a real universe. It isn't mm -hmm. just a figment in his own. Go it isn't just a virtual reality playing in his in his mind. Okay, this is a real universe independent from him that he called out of nothing, and that works that works according according to his laws. Now, uh, among these, these amazing things that he's, the, that he's done, he's created us. He has made us different than the, than the other creatures. We have rational minds that are able to participate to some small, finite degree in his wisdom. Okay. And, but it's his wisdom that they're participating in. It is by his illumination of the mind that, that, that these minds are able to function at all. So that if we are able to make an inference and grasp something, I say, I say, thanks be to the grace of God for that. I don't say, oh, I did this without God. 
So in other words, when people say sometimes that, uh, that natural revelation or natural law is what you can know without revelation, I, I would want to qualify that. Okay. I would say it's, uh, it's without certain modes of grace, but it's not without grace. Okay, so you're um, one of the, uh, I'm uh, speaking as a Vantillian, I, I'm jeal- I want to be jealous of, uh, to guard against human autonomy and yes. pride. Oh, I agree, uh, right. I agree. Pride, human autonomy, uh, uh, an arrogant uh, belief in what I could figure out for myself, uh, made me for, uh, for, for a dozen years of my life uh, uh, absolutely stupid. I, I lost the very belief in God, in the, in the, in the reality of good and evil. Uh, in the possibility of knowing anything. I, I, I ended up where I didn't even believe in my own reality or in my own responsibility for my actions. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to vaunt uh, human pride. Human beings have a certain, uh, I do believe that God made us responsible beings. Our choices are real choices. Mm-hmm. We do have, in that sense, freedom. The word autonomy is not a word that I'm comfortable with because, you know, it says auto autonomy, autonomous, giving the law to yourself. We're Self-law. not giving the law to ourselves. Right. No, this is in, a, in an expression which is used in Catholic natural law theory, but which is a sort of a friendly nod at, uh, at, uh, at uh, Protestant uh, thought about natural revelation. There was a word that, uh, that Pope Paul II used, uh, participated theonomy. Okay. Theonomy meaning the law comes from God. Right. Participated meaning God doesn't just jerk us around with strings. Right. Okay, he doesn't push us around with, 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 with instincts. He gave us minds. He actually invites us to enter into his wisdom, to order our own families, for instance, mm-hmm. but according to the, to the wisdom that he provides to us, right? He, God didn't say, now you all must drive on the left. You must, must drive on the right, right? right? He leaves that to human lawmakers to figure out, but they're working it out from what, from, 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 the, uh, from what they can know for, because of the uh, natural law that we ought to have regard for the safety of our neighbors. Although Ecclesiastes does say the wise man's heart inclines to the right. But <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> so, well, just a dumb joke. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, and that's why that's why, of course, it's it's ungodly to to, to drive on the on the, on the, on the, on the, on the wrong side. <laughs> well, thank you so much for visiting with us. We're very grateful. Good to have you here. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Small interruption would be great. So. Okay. Um, and I'm assuming that uh, I, everywhere I've looked, it's J, like P. Diddy. Yes, right. that's right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I wish I could come up with something clever like what that's supposed to stand for, but I can't. <laughs> okay, ready? Well, uh, Dr. Budashevsky, we'd like to welcome you here to Ken Wired. Thank good, you. To have, good to have you with us. Um, Back up. Yes. Since we're, since we're being taped. You, we better pronounce it right. <laughs> okay, All right. I was going to ask. That. <laughs> it's Bujishevsky. Buj, 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 right? Buj, yeah. It's hard. You look at the D Bujis. and you want to say Budishevsky, but it's it's Bujishevsky. Bujishevsky. Shevsky. Bujishevsky. That's right. Bujishevsky. <laughs> I'll slur over that. <laughs> Buj, okay. Bujishevsky. All right. I'm sorry to make you start <laughs> no, over. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well. Uh, Dr. Bujisevsky. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. B. <laughs> you can say that. that that's fine. <laughs> Bujisevsky. I, I, we last spring, Nancy and I went to Poland, and we were doing some stuff over there, and there were just uh, certain things I couldn't make my mouth. I know they. You know. You know. They. They just lost. Apparently, they used to have vowels. Yes, <laughs> you know, but yeah. they lost them over 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 time. In in the some language. sort of some sort of cataclysm with the Hawaiian <laughs> Islands. Here, uh, this may make it easier because you're logical. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, it wasn't until adulthood that I realized that that's why it's pronounced that way. Okay, now you need a little D at the end of this, right? Bud? No. No, you don't. Bougie. See, the D, for the DZ sound makes a J sound. Oh. 
So, so DZI is G. Okay, Bougie. There is Bougie. no D. There's no D at all. D. It's like S S H in okay. English. S H doesn't make a S H. Okay. Right. The the S sound and the and the H sound are just gone. It's a different sound. It's a sh sound. Okay. Same thing here. The D Z is is really J. Okay. Yeah. Bujishevsky. Perfect. Bujishevsky. Perfect. All right. <laughs> Still rolling, are you? <laughs> <laughs> this could that could be your 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 most popular one. <laughs> hit right there. <laughs> Well, Dr. Bujisevsky, uh, welcome to Canon Wired. Um, good to have you here with us. Um, I'd like to try that again. Bujisevsky. Right. I've never had this much trouble with the name. <laughs> um, Dr. Bujisevsky. <laughs> <laughs> it's because you're thinking about it now. I'm thinking you're going to have me printed me just for Bujisevsky. Dr. Bujisevsky. Uh, it's good to have you here with us at Canon Wired. Uh, look forward to our talk, our visit. Welcome to Moscow. Thank you. Um, I would like to spend our time talking about natural law, which is a specialty of yours, something you focus on.